Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piskor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jimmy, about time we get a little Von Baudet on the on the cam here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. But first, what do you have, man? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics, like the BW zine I just posted this month. This is a collection of panels, uh, title pages, logos, letter columns, ads, things like that, that I pulled from 1980s black and white comics when I fell in love with them. So I have about a dozen of these out-of-print zines and minis that you can download as soon as you join my Patreon. You can also see a lot of my original art, scripts, layouts, process, notes on how I make the comics I make, like Street Angel, Plain Janes, Octobriana, and much more. All of that at patreon.com slash jimrug. This lettering feels real familiar on Judo <laughs> Joe there. Eel O'Brien, I think, is lettering that one. <laughs> Not Stash Gillespie. <laughs> Red Room, the Antisocial Network uh, trade paperback, was in stores uh, November uh, 10th at the uh, at the local comic shops. Man, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Get these things while they're hot because Amazon bought half the print run, man. So if you see it in your comic shop, you got to scoop it up right away. Uh, there's no telling if they're going to be able to get hands on, uh, you know, reprints or forthcoming or the back catalog uh, anytime soon. 70 pages of uh, additional material in the back here. There are other videos on the Kayfabe channel showing this thing off. want to also promote uh, Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, going to get started in December. Go to your local comic shop, get that stuff put on your uh, your pull list. There's, a, there's Jimmy's variant cover for issue <laughs> number one, man, in true... R. Crumb fashion, man. This is so fly, dude. Thank you so much. Feels appropriate for something called trigger warnings, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got that right, man. Let's take a quick look, man, at uh, the complete Cheech Wizard number one, issue one of a four uh, volume series put out by Rip, Rip Off Press. This is something very cool. And my tenure of, as a professional cartoonist, one of the schools that comes up a lot in conversation with people that I meet. It's not School of Visual Arts, and it's not the Hubert School. There's something in the water at Syracuse. Man, I, I thought this when we talked to Scott McLeod. They have such a history of cartooning. It's, it's really uh, worth more investigation. It really is, man. Like, what the heck is going on up there? It's that cold weather. You know, <laughs> you're inside. What else are you going to do, I guess? <laughs> so check this piece out, man. I, I'm assuming they don't say that this is, you know, the very first appearance of Cheech Wizard, but he's certainly more off model than what we know him to be, which is like this is like the iconic image right there. And it seems that this might be, you know, an, an initial drawing of the character. And it was done for a class project. Uh, for like a lettering assignment in a design course or whatever. So, you know, W is for wizard. And here's his, you know, example of his wizard character. Uh, in the inside front cover, see a little uh, biography piece uh, for, for Von Baudet. This comic came out in 1986. Von passed in uh, 1975. Wow, uh, 1986 zine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, explains that that sort of his career trajectory early on uh, started working in fanzines in, in uh, 68, 69, won the Hugo Award for Best Fanzine Artist. I didn't know that the Hugo Awards had uh, awards for Best Fanzine. I was thinking about, like, is the Hugo Award the one that that uh, got mad that Sandman's Midsummer Night Dream won? And it's like, you guys had your roots in fanzine stuff? I need to dig more into fanzines. You yeah. know, like even even Frederick Wortham endorsing fanzines at the end of his life. Like there's so much culture there that I only barely know about because I think it changes. You know, it transitions into being comics being more widely accepted and talked about by other people. But that fanzine culture is such an interesting piece of our history. You know, totally. like I, I don't know that we have comics without that culture being around. And uh, kind of neat the way it would intersect with other stuff like sci-fi and fantasy and you know prose and all these different areas that the fanzines your your Venn diagram in the middle that's pulling this different stuff in for sure, man. You don't have fan culture. Uh, you don't have a reason for there to be back issues and in like a direct market uh, scenario from you know the seventies to the two thousands. Uh, Von so fanzine artist for like two years. 1970, 75, he's working for Cavalier, National Lampoon. These are uh, these are men's mags. These are humor mags. So Cheech Wizard would appear in these magazines, right? But he has to he has to wedge them in to that sort of sensibility. 
And the cool thing about uh, this comic is that we get to see the kind of complete trajectory. We're just taking a look at issue number one, but... Worth noting how young he is, you know, 34. Uh, not, not a very long life to leave the mark that he does, a very influential creator. And it's interesting to think of him in the context of things like National Lampoon, uh, and then also like underground comics, oh, you know, yeah. like it's this guy who's got and graffiti artist, of course, this guy who has feet in several different interesting areas and kind of a legacy in all of these different spots from the jump, man, we're going to launch right into things. Uh, I believe that, you know, this is like a multi-page story. It's like a 10 pager. You could see that it's more rough around the edges than what we know his work to be later on. Uh, the, could, could imagine that this is some stuff that appeared in the fanzines, right? But from the you know first strip forward, this is a guy who creates his own world, man. His own point of view, steeped in, if I had to pull any influences, I would say Walt Kelly, because of the kind of weird syntax of the characters, kind of akin to, to Pogo mm -hmm. and the Oki Finoki cast of characters. Fun to see the graphic sensibility here where he's pulling in screen tones, you know, production stuff, but also giving him some gray tone range. Yeah. A real attention to that part. Play into the format. You know, fanzines, like black and white comics of the 80s, were black and white for, for, for cost reasons, but maybe he wants a little bit more value in there. You bust out the screen tones, man. Uh, you just see he has just such a very unique, specific point of view that you don't see elsewhere in in comics and you know what uh i have to amend some of the stuff i said in old humor uh episodes that we did like from palmer's picks and stuff where i was like peep bag and like only a few other people or people that made me like legitimately crack up add von Bode to the list especially like reading this first 10 pager which is also atypical of this character because it's usually one two page things that would be on like a spread in heavy metal or something like if if you're lucky uh this first story it's about uh it's it's about space race you know if this is appearing in the 60s right it's Kami reds versus the americans and cheech wizards representing america so he has to conjure up a spell to create his own space shuttle and then it's right. a it's just a <laughs> carriage when when you see this it makes me realize like when i started reading this i started to think like that von bode was pretty really cool for kind of accepting maybe his own kind of artistic limitations or something and 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 making great use of like where his facility was to kind of create his his own language when you see this it's like oh no this guy can really draw yeah the other thing that you see on these on this spread is man his lettering was just t top notch from the get go yeah yeah I mean, that's phenomenal that plop is just it's perfect and, you know, he'll play with this stuff, man. So bubbly, so bouncy. There's a real confidence in some of these drawings, too, for thinking of a guy who is, you know, this is, this. you wouldn't maybe know it from this drawing, but you see some of these pieces that are just confidence, the word I think of. There's one line that that represents this stuff, you know, he's not burying it in cross-hatching or anything. Interesting, interesting, uh, that visual acumen. It's so, this is, we're looking at static pages here, but he's able to capture animation and and bounce and stuff like uh you know he's trying to get this this steampunk freaking rickety <laughs> spacecraft to work and he's kicking it and it's kind of chugging along and then boom 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 you know like that's that's nice stuff right there <laughs> man that cosmonaut's fantastic it's like a bear in space yeah man <laughs> <laughs> It's, Good compositions throughout, too. It foretells some stuff, too, man. Like, the Sputnik uh, Soviet guy, you know, he crashes his spaceship, and he's accepting that he's just going to have to die there. But the American is like, no, man. Like, like we're, we're sort of in this... Like, we did this together, man. Like, I don't have all the room in the world to bring you back, but there's some room. You see the two flags together, and it makes me think of stuff like the International Space Station and how... When you're up there, everybody's helping each other out. Like that's the way it goes, man. You're, like you're you're in rarefied space, no pun intended. Uh, anything that happens down on that insignificant globe that you're looking at through that little portal, 
is meaningless when you need, I don't know, some extra toilet paper from your Chinese comrade or something. Right. <laughs> you know, you're both pissing in your outfits. Like, uh, see, I just see a no good commie sympathizer. <laughs> hey, man, maybe uh, maybe the channel gets canceled for sympathizing with the Reds. <laughs> Height of the Cold War and stuff, man. That's tough. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so what we're seeing here, the the one unfortunate thing is that we don't have documentation of like where these strips are appearing. Uh, old collections work that way. They took that stuff for granted. They didn't think that you cared. Uh, and I'm sure that there are better collections of Cheech Wizard and... Uh, the the other Von Bode books. I have precious little in my own library. I'm going to confess. Me too. It's 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 not a cartoonist. I was interested whenever you said let's do this book because Von Bode is sort of a. Um, I have a blind spot there. Yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of his work, obviously, but I don't have a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And I was talking with uh, I was talking with with Jeff Darrow like about let's let's unpack some comics together, man. Join us on the channel. Let's talk some stuff. He was talking about that cobalt joint, you know, mm -hmm. like that as being super important to him. If you have a blind spot for Von Bode, I have a blind spot for Von Bode. But if we get a guy like Uncle Jeff to come through, point out the best piece, man, and do an episode on it. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, you know, back to this piece, I wonder if this appears in a newspaper somewhere, mm. you know, um, because so many undergrounds did, yeah. you know, and those kind of tabloid papers were, were kind of popular for that. So that could have been a Syracuse piece. That could have been a, you know, East Village kind of thing you know like it could have been any of those because like every town seemed to have those kind of alt papers and uh this feels a little bit like that format look at like when you see characters like this doesn't it feel like the shoe comic strip or like mother goose and grim or something like it's it feels like editorial cartoon kind of shorthand or something with all this kind of hatching you know like he's still kind of figuring out his way a little bit. You still see all the Von Bode in there, man, but there's still a little... He's pulling from a little something that is familiar to me. Yeah, that big heavy outline is something that you don't see a lot of in underground comics, which yeah. is, you know, more proof that this is a guy, you know, marching to the beat of his own drum, which is what you want. That's the stuff that ends up, you know, standing the test of time as opposed to uh, everybody follow Crumb or something. And this stuff... Uh, or We're getting into, like, the one-page Cheech Wizard strips, one-page, two-page stuff. Uh, sexually themed for the most part, which is speaking to the audience of Cavalier and the kind of college uh, college crowd of uh, National Lampoon. National Lampoon's influence cannot be understated uh, at the time that he was working in that magazine. Like, the editors of that magazine, guys like Al Jean, uh, go on to become producers of The Simpsons and stuff. Like, these people affect culture. And I'm sure it's National Lampoon magazine where that early generation, 1970s graffiti artists, see bubble lettering like this. And what New York City graffiti was before this moment was you just spray paint your name with no flair and maybe your block number of the street that you live on. And and that's what you do. When Von Bode starts coming out, man, you start to see this kind of lettering with multicolor. One of the tragedies of this collection is that it's taken these beautifully lushly colored uh, Cheech Wizard strips and distilling them down into this like very hairy kind of gray tone and you could just tell that you're missing a lot especially uh, the marker work that Vaughn would use is uh, so poppy so bright extremely lush um, you catch glimmers of it here you start to see him develop his language more and more, like having the dialogue bubbles not really interfere and interact with, with the imagery. That's that's kind of a new thing. You know, you would see versions of that in, like, Humbug or something, where the dialogue is typeset floating above uh, the, the panels. Yeah, I would see it in, like, Kyle Baker. You know, in the, in the 80s, like, he would do some of this stuff, these kind of layouts in, yeah. like, Why I Hate Saturn, you know, way after the fact, but drawing probably on this stuff, drawing on things like Humbug and that tradition. I don't know what that tradition is. It was almost like a sophisticated way to do comics or something. Right. You know, like, like this is a more discerning audience. We're going to separate our text and images a little bit. But it is very distinct. When I was a kid, man, I really thought that this was, like, a whole head and that was just a nose. <laughs> but but uh, when you start to read about the subject matter and all the blowjobs and uh, gonorrheas and stuff. I don't think that's a nose, man. That's hilarious. That almost feels like a piece that had to develop a little bit as is, uh, is the character and the story's developed. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, you see there's no evidence of it yes, uh, exactly. early on. 
uh, starting to get those like little liz- lizard images, those lizard guys that he's sort of known for into the strip as we get deeper into the 70s. I would see these in heavy metal, mm-hmm. you know, but I think that they would already be reprints by that point of, uh, you know, the older yeah, if he died National in, Lampoon uh, strips. In, in 75, I mean, heavy metal doesn't, I don't think it starts till a couple years after that. You're right. These these very kind of like one note post love generation, you know, free love kinds of uh, punchlines and subject matters in an era where you don't have a condom and you're messing around. The worst thing that could happen is a person gets pregnant or you have to take a pill to take care of whatever you accidentally contract. You know, different era, different time period, man. But. Uh, all super fun, and the comic strip was still kind of viable. I'm talking about the daily comic strip. And this is a cartoonist who's marching to the beat of his own drummer who could comfortably stand up against anything that was in the newspaper. You know, this is a strong cartoonist. It's He's talking about the subject matter he wants to talk about. It's more adult-themed, but the strength of the cartooning, the vocabulary that he's created for himself, could stack up against anything that uh could have been seen in the in the heyday or the height of your newspaper comic strip which was considered a pinnacle for decades and decades and decades of the me- of the form of the medium i think that that's like one of the strengths of 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 this guy that we're looking at right here jimmy i think that's a strength of the underground guys who really transcend their origins yeah. or their time period is having those elements in there. That cartoon element, I think, is the universal element that allows this stuff to carry on generations past its original publication yeah. because it's part of that tradition. Totally. You know, it's totally different subject matter, like you say, Ed. It's a different o- intended for a different audience, you know, more mature subject, but it's still using that language of the comics that we grew up with, the car- even the cartoons that we grew up with, which really gives this a certain kind of universal, timeless appeal. So here's the thing, man. Every now and again, we do these episodes. We check out some stuff that we're not 100% familiar with. And I like to create a kind of like feedback loop with the audience. So what I'm asking for the Cartoonist Kayfabe audience, man, in the comment section, let me know what your favorite Von Baudet comics are. Let me know what the best Cheech Wizard uh, reprint packages are. Uh, Fill these blind spots in for us. Uh, Let's have some engagement. Let's have some back and forth. Uh, because this is a cartoonist that I'm very excited to investigate more. Like you said, I have some stuff, man, in, in, in drips and drabs uh, in other anthology magazines and other uh, just just other places. What's the quits essential work? What's the first thing I need to read to get more acquainted? What is his masterpiece? I want to know all of it. And the audience can help us out there, man. Uh, very excited to hear some feedback on that. I'm glad it's a ripoff press book too. I just picked up um, the best of ripoff press volume one, and uh, you know I love all I, I love all this stuff. Like this is history of publishing, and and not exactly self publishing, but that small press publishing and alternative media and all these different pieces sort of come together in a book like this. But uh, there's I think a lot more to pull off of the ripoff press bone too, as as we kind of maybe dive into more of this kind of alternative underground comics and the stuff that persevered through that era on, into today. Funny you mention that, Jimmy, because I was pulling stuff for future episodes, and I have a couple issues of Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. We're going to have to go. unpack on a future episode. Uh, K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, man? Subscribe to my Patreon, patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. I have about a dozen of those available right now. You can see my original art, layouts, uh, scripts. The process that I make the comics I make, like Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, The Plain Janes, and Octobriana, all of that you can find at patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room, the antisocial network. Trade paper back in stores now, man. Get it if you see it, because they're going to go quick, man. Amazon bought half the print run, so... Comic shops order heavy on that sucker. Uh, Red Room uh, Trigger Warnings issue number one coming out in December with a fantastic Jim Rugg variant cover. Once again, you got to co- talk to your comic shops to make sure you get your hands on all that stuff. Serialized in Red Room Comics on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. You can get links to all my comics, everything I just mentioned at my link tree in the description below this video. What else do we have? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, we're going to be on our way. Read more underground comics.